I'm glad to welcome you to this conference for the signing of the Treaty of Peace with Japan. That was the voice of President Harry S. Truman, as heard during the first ever coast-to-coast -coast television broadcast in 1951. TV had come a long way since being introduced in the 20s, and the decade ahead would result in booming growth for television programming. Only about 3 million American households had TVs in 1950, but that number skyrocketed to more than 15 times as many by the end of the decade. The Golden Age instilled an unwavering interest and eagerness in television, laying the groundwork for more diverse, entertaining, and lively programming to come. Just before the 1980s, the TV industry was on the verge of something special, thanks to advancements in technology. One example of this debuted in 1977, Cube, a cable television system that offered exclusive channels and other innovative features. Cube launched with three levels of programming that included 10 standard broadcast channels, 10 interactive service channels, and 10 community channels, featuring content such as sports, weather updates, and children's programming. Pinwheel was the flagship show of Cube's children's community channel, C3. Premiering in 1977, Pinwheel was a children's show similar to Sesame Street, featuring skits with actors and puppets as well as animated segments. Its vibrant setting and storytelling made it a hit with kids. Audiences loved C3's anchor show so much that the network would soon change its name to have the same title, Pinwheel, airing marathons of the show. This would serve as the foundation of what would soon transition into the first all-children's network. As such a huge success only two years after its launch, the channel Pinwheel would again rebrand with a new name. Nickelodeon debuted April April 1st, 1979, with the tagline, The Young People's Satellite Network. In addition to the Pinwheel Show, Nickelodeon aired original programs such as America Goes Bananas, Nickel Fritz, and By The Way. Continuing through the 80s, Nickelodeon would also air syndicated shows such as You Can't Do That On Television, a sketch comedy program that established roots for the network's future, most notably, Green Slime. Nickelodeon, however, would struggle in the mid-80s, operating a loss and plummeting as the worst-rated cable network. The channel's lack of successful programming resulted in poor viewership. The still young Nickelodeon didn't have a bright future. In need of a change, the network brought on new management. Industry gurus Brad Cyber and Alan Goodman had Nickelodeon not only to reinvigorate it, but they would also push it to unmatched success, being the driving forces behind upcoming animated masterpieces, live action classics, and a frenzy that would inspire a generation. By the 80s, Universal Studios Hollywood was highly successful, both in its studio portion and its adjacent theme park. Universal wanted to take that unique combination of a working studio and a theme park to the East Coast's surging tourism industry. In 1986, Universal's parent company announced a brand new counterpart in Orlando, Florida, opening in 1990. The theme park studio hybrid destination would take inspiration from the original Hollywood park, incorporating shows, rides, and other attractions into a working production studio. The park would include multiple Hollywood quality sound stages dedicated to film and show production. Having an interest for the impending Florida site, Nickelodeon would partner with the Universal Studios in 1998. Nickelodeon saw Universal's new studio complex as the idyllic venue for its first production studio. Unlike a traditional Hollywood studio, Nickelodeon's Orlando site wouldn't be located deep in a back lot somewhere. This would have a prime location in an active theme park. In this spot, Nickelodeon wouldn't have to ask its audience to visit. They would already be there. This was perfect for a network planning numerous live action shows with studio audiences. Filming began in Spring 1989, setting the tone for a golden decade to come. Welcome to the Nick Studios, ladies and gentlemen. We are live! We are coming to you from our new home right here in Orlando, Florida. Nickelodeon Studios officially opened on Universal Studios Florida's opening day, June 7, 1990. The inauguration ceremony special was the station's first live broadcast, a Mark Summers hosted opening day celebration. In true Nickelodeon fashion, the buzz was electric and the building was eccentric. Mismatching patterns, lively colors, the design perfectly captured the spirit and excitement that would swarm Nickelodeon Studios for years to come. The studio was made complete in October 1990 with the newly installed Slime Geyser, a slime-powered amalgamation of tubes and tanks animated by a green climax matched in wonder only by Yellowstone's Old Faithful. Nickelodeon cemented its permanent stay at the Universal-based studio as demonstrated by bearing a time capsule in 1992, not to be opened until 2042. The future was promising for Nickelodeon Studios. The theme park-based active studio was a factory for for what many call the golden era of children's television. The network was on a roll with no shortage of production throughout the decade. 
tape before a live audience in Nickelodeon Studios at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. Located inside a world-class theme park, Nickelodeon Studios Productions almost always had a live studio audience. On filming days, a limited amount of theme park guests could participate in the audience during filming for one of Nickelodeon's many live action shows. Productions shot here include non-scripted shows such as Family Double Dare, Global Guts, and Legends of the Hidden Temple. Nickelodeon Studios was also the filming site of scripted shows including Keenan and Kel, Clarissa Explains It All, and Gullah Gullah Island. Besides being open for live audiences, Nickelodeon Studios was a year-round attraction with a studio tour open to theme park guests. The tour began by riding an escalator to the second level where guests made their way to a viewing area for Stage 19. Here, guests overlooked live productions, performances, or rehearsals, depending on what was happening on that particular day. Next on the tour, guests entered an observation area over Stage 18 to watch production unfold. After this, guests got an even more behind-the-scenes look when visiting a post-production room to see the video and audio editing processes. These portions of the tour were opportunities to learn about the production process of Nick Nickelodeon shows. After getting a glimpse into these active sound stages and what goes into making these shows, it was now time for the interactive part of the tour. Guests were then led downstairs to the Gak Kitchen, where their taste buds joined in on the fun. The menu consisted of Gak, slime, and other gooey goodies you could find on Nickelodeon at the time. In this area of the building was the wardrobe department, where guests could try on cartoonish and zany outfits. Had this been the end of the tour, it still would have been a fun attraction, but the tour's main appeal was up next, the Game Lab. This was a non-televised area set up like a mock studio where Nickelodeon would test possible new games for their programming. This meant in the middle of a theme park, the everyday guest, everyday kid, could experience Nickelodeon as they saw it on TV. They were active participants in the game lab, getting the opportunity to make noise, join in activities, and get slimed. As guests exited, they could provide feedback by answering a few survey questions on a touchscreen, rating their experience. At no other place in the world could you experience all this in one day. Seeing in real life what you've watched so many times on an old fuzzy TV, having the chance to tell your friends back home you got drenched with Nickelodeon's signature slime, laughing and just being a kid for 45 minutes or so in the middle of your theme park experience, Nickelodeon Studios was a special place that made a tremendous impact on children across the nation in the 90s. From the iconic show shot there to the chance to visit in person, all during the formative years of childhood, there wasn't another attraction like Nickelodeon Studios. The experience as a whole was educational while maximizing on the fun to be had at Nickelodeon Studios in the 90s. The studio tour would go relatively unchanged for over a decade, but disappointing changes would be made June 15th, 2001, when the attraction suffered major staffing and budget cuts. The new tour featured notable omissions right away. The attraction originally would take guests upstairs, but now instead would stay on the main floor and head toward the Gat Kitchen area, completely skipping portions of the tour that gave guests a peek into actual filming and the post-production processes taking place right in front of them. The new tour started with a brief pass through the prop and makeup departments, showing just a very small glimpse into the studio's behind the scenes. The game lab was no longer the testing ground for potential Nickelodeon games, but instead, now it was a place to experience very brief games based on Nickelodeon shows. While the original tour would take about 45 minutes, this version would last roughly 10 minutes, drastically condensing the overall experience. As one guest who visited in 2003 put it, quote, it was almost like visiting a sick friend, but knowing that the doctor wasn't going to do anything to help them, unquote. The studio was stripped of what made it special, getting what felt like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see the magic behind some of the more beloved children's television shows. What once was an experience to look forward to was now just a way to kill some time while at Universal Studios Florida. The new studio tour was a bleak look into where things were headed. Through the 90s, Nickelodeon had experienced tremendous success. This era laid down the basis that would make the channel among the top rated in television history. For a network that felt like it was run by kids, having a studio in an Orlando theme park made a lot of sense, and you could credit a lot of Nickelodeon's success to that synergy. From a production standpoint, however, Nickelodeon wanted to make a change, moving some of its productions to the West Coast. Many of the network's animation work through the 90s came out of Games Animation Studio in Burbank, California. But in 1998, that studio officially transitioned transitioned into Nickelodeon Animation Studio, making a permanent home on the opposite coast of Orlando's famed Nickelodeon Studios. The Universal-based studio still was functioning, but Nickelodeon had started moving some of its productions out to Hollywood, with one of the network's marquee shows, All That, filming a season in California in the mid-90s. By 1997, Nickelodeon had acquired the historic Earl Carroll Theater, a Hollywood, California soundstage that would be rebranded to Nickelodeon on Sunset after the station acquired it. Notable shows of the time that were filmed there include All 
all that, The Amanda Show and Kenan and Kel, meaning the Orlando studio was seeing fewer and fewer productions. By the early 2000s, Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando had been renting out its sound stages on occasion due to reduced productions. During this time, the station had also auctioned off over 2,000 screen use props from over the years, emptying out house, so to speak. As to why, you could look at a few different reasons. Nickelodeon Studios was scarcely being used for filming at this point. In fact, the theme park altogether didn't pan out to be the production venue it was designed to be. However, it was highly successful as a tourist destination. Theme park guests at the time were flocking to the newly opened Islands of Adventure right next door, and theme park attendance declined in the early 2000s due to the tourism crash that followed 9-11. Orlando's Nickelodeon Studios not only was losing its value to the network, but it was also no longer the enticing theme park attraction it once was. In summer 2004, filming began at the Orlando studio on a game show called Nickelodeon Splat. The program would air quick segments during commercial breaks of other Nickelodeon shows. Splat would be short-lived, lasting only one season, a little over five months. This would be the final production filmed at Nickelodeon Studios. Sound stages 18 and 19, the two shown on the tour and used for many shows, were no longer needed by Nickelodeon. The studio tour, however, would continue. But with no studio activity to show, the attraction consisted only of the game lab. The final final surviving segment of a waning studio. With a diminishing budget and a disheartened atmosphere that lacked any of the network's excitement, Nickelodeon Studios at Universal Studios Florida gave its final tour on April 30th, 2005. Nearly 15 years prior, the studio opened with a huge ceremony. Its send-off couldn't have been a starker contrast. An unceremonious goodbye to a studio that shaped so many 90s kids' childhoods. How fast time flies. With the network now fully moved out of Orlando, work began in 2005 to strip the former Nickelodeon Studios building and begin its renovation for a new attraction. This process included completely removing any Nickelodeon markings from the exterior. The slime geyser was dismantled and removed, and the famed time capsule was relocated to the Nickelodeon Suites Resort in Orlando. Meanwhile, Soundstage 18, a building that was once used to film shows like Legends of the Hidden Temple, Keenan and Kel, and Figure It Out, was used for a one-time haunted house called Where Evil Hides, a part of Universal's annual scare event, Halloween Horror Nights, in 2005. The studio quickly became a shell of its former self, with development further pushing what this building used to be to the past. Now completely disassociated with its former purpose and glory, the former Nickelodeon Studios building received updates that made it nearly unrecognizable. The soundstage 18 half of the building was set for construction, making its transformation into Sharp Aquios Theater, the future home of the Blue Man Group show that would open in 2007. Time moves on. 2012. With the Nickelodeon generation entering adulthood, it was high tide for a wave of 90s nostalgia. As young adults were uncovering pop culture gems and memories from yesteryear, the legend of Nickelodeon Studios started surfacing. Its doors have been closed for quite some time now, with little to no activity in half of the building. Remnants of Nickelodeon Studios could be found at the time in the Jimmy Neutron's Nicktoon Blast attraction. But that wasn't enough for those wondering what has become of the studio building. Former urban explorer Adam the Woo set out to see for himself what was left of the defunct attraction, unofficially making for the studio's first filming in close to a decade. He showed the world the studio's condition at the time, documenting equipment, signage, and murals that managed to survive. The doors led to all the same rooms as before. The physical parts of the building were familiar enough, somewhat intact, to how things used to be. But the classic Nickelodeon touch was long gone. With little changes made here and there, the building was slowly turning into something else, a hard reality to see for those wanting to relive the magic of the 90s. The building today is almost entirely washed clean of what it used to be. The building, which is occasionally rented out for productions, has been painted in neutral white and blue to match the Blue Man Group attraction next door. Murals and attractions have been painted over or removed. Even the escalators that were once at the beginning of the tour have since been removed. One of the final remnants of Nickelodeon Studios can be found in the bathrooms, green slime colored tiles decorating the floor. The time capsule, which was relocated to a nearby Nickelodeon themed hotel, has now made its permanent home at the Burbank Animation Studio, at least until 2042 when it's open. When that happens, the chapter on Nickelodeon Studios will officially come to a close. 90s Nickelodeon not only made a generational impact, but became almost synonymous with 90s nostalgia. A big reason for that is Nickelodeon Studios, a memory that lives on in many of us. For those grasping for Nickelodeon Studios nostalgia, it still does linger in the parks with the former studio building still standing, a current Spongebob store pants gift shop in Universal Studios Florida, and a hopeful future with ideas like a Spongebob land that didn't quite come to fruition in the soon-to-open Universal Studios Beijing. 
Media, like time, moves on. Pinwheel turned into Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon grew into Nickelodeon Studios. And now the network found a home in California with a team of creatives working to make this decade just as impactful as those in the past. Cementing memories for a new generation experiencing their childhood.